Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. Tasha Ellis, clinical social worker and public health practitioner. And for this February 2024 Black History Month, we are observing the theme African American and the arts. I also wanted to take this opportunity to talk about Black health and wellness. And so for the next 45 minutes plus, there will be a conversation regarding it. So just to give you an overview, I will talk about Black history through the lens of well-being and mention some historical events as it relates to Black health and wellness. I'll also discuss wellness dimensions, looking through the SAMHSA model, and also talk about the whole person. We will also touch on social determinants of health as they relate to the African-American community and health. And lastly, um, we'll hone in on cultural humility and what that means for equitable health care. Throughout this conversation, there will be an opportunity for you to engage um, through reflective questions. There will also be Black health and wellness figures spotlighted throughout this conversation. So our first spotlight of the day is Mary Eliza Mahoney, known as America's first Black nurse. She was one among four students of a class of 42 to graduate from this class at the New England Hospital for Women and Children, um, was amongst the first class to graduate. Uh, she's received numerous awards and there is an award name in her honor. For the most part of Mary Eliza's career, she served as a private nurse along the East Coast. Later on, she became the director of an asylum um, orphanage for children in New York. And today, a monument stands at her gravesite in Everett, Massachusetts. So just to um, reflect upon some historical events significant to Black health and wellness, um, here you'll see I've laid out a number of events and by no means are these um, um, an extensive exhausted list, but these are some key um, events and also people along this history. So first you'll see uh, mentioned here Onesimus dating back to 1721. Onesimus was an enslaved African-American who described the African method for inoculating against smallpox. His technique was later adapted by a British doctor who uh, used it to fight a less virulent organism. And so um, you can see the influence dating back to the enslaved African days. Next, we have James Durham, who is known as America's first black doctor. He set up his own uh, medical practice in the New Orleans area. Dr. Durham was instrumental in saving lives during the yellow fever pandemic. Moving on into the 1800s, uh, we see the emergence of the Freedmen's Hospital. And this was the first federally funded hospital uh, founded to care for the enslaved, especially those who were freed after the Civil War. Um, also important to mention that it uh, cared for displaced whites. It was located in the Washington DC area and today is known as Howard University Hospital. 1895, uh, we see the creation of the National Medical Association uh, this professional organization was created for Black doctors and health professionals who at the time um, were not honored membership into the American Medical Association. So this um, was founded during an era of separate but equal. Today, the National Medical Association still stands representing the interests of over 50,000 uh, African-American physicians. Moving on into the 1900s, in 1940, uh, we 
see the work of Charles Drew. And many of us today know of his work as a uh, cutting edge in terms of uh, storing blood plasma. Uh, also of note, he was the first black to earn a doctorate degree from Columbia Uni University. Uh, he was also instrumental in managing two of the largest blood banks during World War II. And then uh, moving on into the 21st century, we see the release of the Unequal Treatment Report. Uh, this report came from the Institute of Medicine. Um, today, they're known as the National Academies, and it assessed the extent of racial and ethnic disparities. They found that among the sources um, are healthcare systems, as well as providers. And so um, this system, um, results in disparities and also uh, inequalities around healthcare. Uh, this year, we do expect a 20 year follow-up report to be released in the summer. So um, that report will revisit unequal treatment and it's expected from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. So to talk about the definition of health and wellness, um, our topic of the day, you'll see here definitions from the World Health Organization. And this is important to note um, because of the African diaspora, and you'll hear a bit more about it in a couple of slides. So the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being not merely the absence of disease. And then wellness on the other hand is that optimal state of health that we strive for. Um, it is expressed as a positive approach to living. So uh, we have our first poll of the day. When you consider these, how would you describe well-being? Because we often hear about well-being. So when we just oppose that to health and wellness, uh, how do you describe well-being? And I'm seeing a number of comments in the chat, the mental and the physical, holistic. Thank you so much for your comments. So I mentioned that we would talk about uh, the African diaspora and just to give you some context um, as it relates to black cultural health. The African diaspora uh, is a collection of communities throughout the world. Um, and these communities descended from native Africans or people from Africa. So we know that within uh, the Americas, we have, um, people who emigrated from the continent of Africa. And then we also have the descendants of enslaved persons uh, who still reside in the Americas, uh, many who identify themselves as Black or African-Americans. We also have a number of um, other African descent people who live in the Caribbean, uh, South America, and so forth. So these cultural roots uh, have influenced holistic health and wellness practices over time. And here I've carved out four major areas uh, you'll see noted here, food and nutrition, spiritual health, natural health practices, and then the arts and culture. So um, as it relates to food and nutrition, uh, one, a uh, culinary historian I wanted to focus in on is Jessica B. Harris. Her works have been instrumental in making that connection to not only uh, how food nourishes, but also tying those roots back to Africa. In her work known as High on the Hog, a culinary journey from Africa to America, she talks about um, various pieces that make that connection including equity of the foodways and waterways, how the hands of Africans uh, have shaped and influenced foods throughout the world, um, whether it be
gumbo, or even use of African staples such as okra, uh, sweet potatoes, yams. And we also know that many of these foods can be used uh, for the purpose of food as medicine to treat and also to better health. When we talk about spiritual health, uh, here I've chosen to focus in on the Black church, which has been a major source of strength and resilience across African-American communities. Uh, you'll see mentioned here, Henry Louis Gates, Harvard professor. And he actually uh, narrated a documentary on the Black church. This documentary is available through PBS. Um, I believe it's a four part series. And I do encourage you to explore that to learn more about the Black church uh, dating to um, colonial times, post-Civil War, during the uh, Great Migration and into modern times. So that is very educational as it relates to gaining more information about uh, this spiritual source of strength for Black Americans. And throughout this talk, you'll hear me use the term Black and African Americans interchangeably. Again, that goes back to that, that diaspora context. The third area you'll see mentioned here uh, is natural health practices. And these range from herbal and naturopathic to midwifery. Uh, one key figure I'd uh, like to highlight is Dr. Sunyata Amen a fifth generation natural herbalist, a naturopathic physician of African uh, Caribbean heritage. And she uh, talks about her family's practice, uh, which was set up in the Harlem area and the influence it had on black health and wellness um, in terms of treating ailments over time. Uh, one spice, for example, turmeric, she highlighted um, in terms of its disease fighting properties and how she hardly ever had a cold while growing up. And today she operates uh, tea shops in the DC area known as Calabas Tea and Tonic. And so the arts and culture is the fourth uh, category talked about here. Arts and culture have been a major source of uh, wellness for Blacks. It's had a profound impact on social connectedness and cultural pride, essentially uh, raising the esteem of African-Americans. A key era uh, known as the Harlem Renaissance sparked during the 1920s and 30s. And with that, we saw an emergence of writers, culinary artists um, within Black communities in Harlem, New York. Very impactful. And I encourage you to learn more about it as well. And then decades later, uh, we saw movements such as fashion and hip hop. And those continue to be impactful. Again, the arts and culture have um, greatly contributed to the social connectedness and raise the cultural esteem, which um, greatly contributes to wellness. So I mentioned black midwifery um, in the previous slide as it relates to uh, natural health. And I wanted to kind of hone in on this recent article that talked about black midwifery, uh, tracing it back to uh, pre-colonial times. And so um, when the women, enslaved women came from West Africa, they brought with them their skills as healers to humanity. And many of um, those women were known as grand midwives because of their knowledge and skill, not only as birthers, but also um, ability to treat and heal a number of ailments. During that time, uh, social birthing was the norm. And so all women uh, delivered via care through midwifery. 
Also important to note during the 19th century, we did begin to see uh, midwifery waning as a practice. And so there was a shift to obstetrics, uh, bringing in more medical type uh, interventions and care for expecting mothers. Midwifery did gain professional status in the late 20th century. Um, however, uh, racial minorities often did not feel part of that movement because um, the disparities and the racial justice pieces were not, were not always captured as it relates to reproductive health. So when you uh, hear that, and especially the shift from midwifery to obstetrics, what role might this have played in access to midwifery care and maternal child mortality today? And I'll pause there to invite your comments and thoughts. So when this shift occurred from midwifery to obstetrics, Years and decades later, what role might this shift have played in terms of being able to access midwifery care and our experiences with maternal child mortality today? I see some mentioned negative. We also um, see that there were a number of um, natural birthing organizations, midwifery professional organizations that emerge, including uh, birthing projects, Black Mamas Alliance and so forth. And so many of these thrived and they're still around today to be able to um, ensure that women can have access to natural birthing. However, um, Important to note that there may be still some barriers as it relates to healthcare coverage for midwifery. So um, during the opening, I mentioned that this Black History Month 2024 theme is African-Americans and the arts. And this theme is established annually by the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. So during this 2024 observance, um, we're highlighting Blacks' contributions to a range of arts, including performing arts, literature, fashion, language, film, music, architecture, culinary, and so forth. So as you can see, a very rich uh, range and um, cultural expressions through the arts. Culinary arts is of significance. And I mentioned Dr. Jessica B. Harris, who um, is the 2020 James Beard Lifetime Achievement Awardee. Um, she has a number of major works around culinary arts. She was also um, a travel journalist for Essence Magazine for some time. And she wrote the book, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America. It became a documentary um, and it's through Netflix. So there is a season one and season two, again, very educational. And I encourage you to view that. It talks about uh, food as equity, as well as how staples um, have been influential in terms of foods and dishes in the Americas. So um, as you hear about this, what are your takeaways? And how does it connect to wellness? And you will learn more about that as you watch that documentary. Our next cultural conversation spotlight of the day is Dr. Dave James Durham. Again, he is known as America's first black doctor. He bought his freedom at the age of 21. Um, also uh, important to note in addition to him 
saving lives during the yellow fever epidemic. He also was distinguished um, for being multilingual. And because of his uh, multilingual abilities, he was able to care for numerous people in that community. So now we'll talk about the dimensions of wellness, specifically the eight dimensions. And this is through the SAMHSA model. So you'll see here on this wellness wheel, intellectual, career, physical, social, existential, which is also spiritual, emotional, environmental, and financial. And at the center of that is your well-being, which I um, asked you your perspective on earlier and got a, a variety, including it being holistic, which we can very well see here. We also know that these dimensions are interconnected. For example, a person's career and their emotional wellness could have implications for their financial wellness, how much they're able to earn. Similarly, um, a person's environment where they live could have impact on their sense of well being and purpose. Think about living in a clean environment versus a pollutant one and what that could mean for your um, meaning and your existence in that area, in that community. We also know that in a number of these areas, uh, Blacks are disproportionately affected. And because of that, um, there is some relationship to chronic conditions, including heart disease and hypertension. For example, um, if a person environment does not afford them the green spaces or even the infrastructures to engage in physical activity, uh, that could raise their risk factors for developing these chronic conditions. Um, socioeconomic and earning potential, as well as social stressors affect Blacks. And we know that uh, discrimination and microaggressions play a part in that according to the literature. Uh, one piece of research I wanted to point out came from the Pew Research Center a survey was conducted um, in 2023, and it talked about how Black Americans report finding joy. And so um, across income levels, Blacks report that they find joy through family or friends, faith, and travel. So for me, these were not surprising. Again, that social connectedness, also uh, faith and that uh, church community being a source of resilience. I also wanted to bring in whole health. So many may have heard about whole health and whole person care. Uh, this definition comes from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And they provided this definition and the Achieving Whole Health Report which was released in 2023. Whole health is physical, behavioral, spiritual, and socioeconomic well being, as defined by individuals, families, and communities. So we can certainly see the holistic um, interconnectedness in this definition. And they also um, mention not only the individual level, but families and communities. Also, uh, a whole health care system and what it encompasses was defined um, in that comprehensive report. And so um, a whole health care system is people-centered, comprehensive and holistic, having an upstream focus, which is very important because we're seeking to um, intervene, to mitigate barriers and issues that would cause um, predisposition and also um, greater risk factors for certain conditions. 
the system is also accountable and equitable to be whole health caring. And lastly, there's team well-being. So um, care for the people who care for persons and beneficiaries. And the next couple of slides, I wanted to um, mention a couple of governmental approaches through our public health system um, that's addressing whole person care. And so um, this first one talks about the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Earlier this year, uh, 2024, they mentioned the integrated behavioral health model and this approach will include not only behavioral and physical health, uh, but also incorporating health-related social needs, realizing that it takes much more um, for a person to manage their care and to mitigate certain barriers. CMS does apply an equity framework in working to advance healthcare. One example of that um, is improvements in drug coverage. And so um, insulin has been enhanced in terms of coverage. And we know that Blacks are disproportionately affected by diabetes. In fact, in 2019, non-Hispanic Blacks were twice as likely as non-Hispanic Whites to die from diabetes. So this whole person uh, care approach is meaningful. Another governmental approach is through the USDA. And they're um, advancing an ecosystem and innovations around treating um, and addressing obesity. And so with that approach, they're partnering with minority serving institutions and land grant universities. And being a health and well being coach, as well as a doctoral public health practitioner, um, I can tell you that healthy eating matters, and that is throughout the literature, especially as a lifestyle approach. Uh, black women are affected at greater rates of obesity compared to others. And so when you hear about food and it specifically um, being a lifestyle approach, what else is needed to address the obesity epidemic in minority populations? When you think about food and pairing it with another lifestyle approach, uh, what else comes to mind? And I invite you to share in the chat. So I'm seeing comments that it matters. And one piece I'll share has to do with uh, cultural eating approaches. So we know that soul food is popular amongst African-Americans, but looking at ways to prepare it uh, using healthier uh, ingredients is something to consider, as well as um, pairing healthy eating with physical activity. And physical activity, um, culturally speaking, for some may not be going to the gym. It could be African dancing. It could be uh, even playing softball or kickball in your community. So at this time, I'd like to hone in on social determinants of health as it relates to black health and wellness. And we all know social determinants of health as those conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And some would also say pray. And you will see here the um, Healthy People 2030 Social Determinants of Health model, uh, which highlights the economic piece, healthcare access, education, uh, neighborhood context, and so forth. Uh, one piece I do want to point out has to do with redlining that occurred um, within African-American communities. 
So uh, with the redlining, services were systemically denied by lenders when um, African-Americans sought to purchase homes. And because of this, um, there is a history of Blacks being born into impoverished neighborhoods. Quality of life may be lacking in communities. And economically speaking, there is a wealth gap due to inflated interest rates because of the low number of uh, institutions who would actually lend to Blacks. And so um, interest rates were, at, were often inflated. And this uh, has over time contributed to wealth gaps between African-Americans and others. As it relates to social determinants of health, faith is a factor. So earlier I mentioned that prayer slash faith slash religion, some would say, um, is a social determinant. Uh, one piece to point out is that faith has been a constant. The faith community itself has been a constant for African-Americans. And you heard that earlier um, when I talked about the Black church. One particular um, piece to point out has to do with religion. Um, and the, the literature shows that it can be impactful across the life cycle. Several religious communities have better health outcomes compared to non-practicing ones. The Seventh-day Adventists, for example, uh, live longer and they're um, in the blue zone for their longevity for living longer. And so the faith community is within the context of where people live, work, and play. Um, within those faith communities, we may see social ministries, even healthy living groups, and youth socialization occurring. I did want to point out that Black families are not a monolith as it relates to religion. So there is diversity. According to that Pew Research uh, survey, 66% of Black adults identify as Protestant. Some also practice as non-denominational Christians. One particular study to point out has to do with, with retirees ages 50 and older. Um, and the ones who reported having attended religious services uh, was associated with having a lower hazard mortality. We also know that according to the literature, uh, religiosity may reduce the risk of obesity in African-American women. Um, interventions such as healthy teaching kitchens and nutrition ministries can be impactful in the church setting. So we've started to see these um, as part of those ministries. Another poll of the day, when you consider faith and religion, which of the two do you perceive as having greater influence on health? Between faith and religion. And these are two separate domains. So I'm seeing some comments, faith, because it requires more self-determination, whereas religious, religion is more of a practice. And then I'm also seeing religion um, can actually help one to gain access to certain services. And that's true um, because as mentioned, where a person attends a church could give them access to a healthy teaching kitchen, for example, or a nutrition ministry. So thank you for sharing. Our next cultural conversation spotlight of the day is Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, past president of the American Public Health Association, who is a family physician and epidemiologist. Dr. Jones's work has been instrumental in terms of teaching and naming racism, as well as measuring its impact on health and well-being. 
She's also well known for her allegories that illuminates inequities and helps others to understand uh, racism and equity in plain language. So I do encourage you to um, learn more about those. These uh, videos are available on YouTube. Some of her lectures are also available on YouTube. Recently in 2023, she completed a visiting professorship at King's College in London. And here is one of her quotes that comes from an allegory known as the Cliff of Good Health. And it reads, if a lot of people are near the edge of the cliff, even a really strong fence will not be enough. To keep everyone safe, we need to move all the people away from the edge of the cliff. We do this by addressing the drivers of poor health that go beyond our genes and beyond our personal experiences. So to highlight a couple of uh, health disparities in Black persons, um, and these are significant, heart disease and obesity. So Blacks are disproportionately affected by heart diseases, the leading cause of deaths. Amongst Black women uh, ages 20 and older, 50% have a heart disease, and some are undiagnosed. And so that is troublesome and burdensome. Obesity, about four out of five African-American women are overweight or obese, according to the CDC. One particular study uh, looked at black and white differences in obesity within rural areas. And it found that uh, blacks have a higher rate of obesity compared to whites in rural areas. Potential uh, explanations include the experience of structural racism in rural settings, as well as health access to health care and lower health behaviors. So um, in terms of health care facilities, there is a such thing known as health care deserts, which may exist in rural areas, um, whereby persons may not have access to clinics or even pharmacies for hours. And we know that obesity itself um, is a disease named by the American Medical Association. It is also a major risk factor for many of these chronic health conditions. And I did wanna talk about a couple of popula population-based um, interventions in place to address chronic health conditions in African Americans. So the first one is REACH, Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. And it is grant funded by the CDC. Um, the aim is to provide culturally tailored interventions to address, to address these preventable risk factors. So um, fostering approaches such as food and nutrition security, addressing tobacco use and so forth. And with this REACH um, initiative, nearly 3 million persons have had better access to healthy foods. The next one is the Jackson Heart Study. And it is the largest single site community-based investigation involving genetic factors associated with cardiovascular diseases in Blacks. This uh, Jackson Heart Study recently uh, celebrated its 20 year anniversary. So it has been instrumental in terms of the research around genetic factors. It's also included nested family cohorts of nearly 1,500 families, family members. It also prepares scholars and community research fellows. So here is another question for you to ponder. How might this large scale study improve culturally informed care? Especially um, with it being focused on African-Americans. 
So I invite you to ponder that question. And these next slides, I'll talk about cultural humility. So cultural humility um, is an ongoing process of self-examination and learning to gain um, knowledge about yourself and other cultures. It was first discussed by two physicians out of the San Francisco area, Drs. Turvalon and Murray Garcia, and they uh, purported it as a way to train medical students at the time versus cultural competence. So cultural humility takes it a step further. The three pieces encompassing um, cultural humility include that lifelong learning, power imbalances, and institutional accountability. So with the lifelong learning, again, the person is seeking um, to learn about themselves and others. And essentially they become a student of the client. With the power imbalances, um, they begin to acknowledge the client as the expert in their lives. And that um, influences shared treatment planning, as well as respectful partnerships when it comes to public health practice and research. Institutional accountability. So many disciplines, uh, whether it be social work, psychology or nursing uh, have ethics that uh, encompasses uh, cultural humility. And with these ethics and um, values, we can use those to hold systems accountable. We can also assert human-centered values in general to foster equitable systems. So, um, Connecting the dots here between cultural humility and equity. Once we've gained that information about a culture and we're able to understand their unique needs, we can then um, design programs and services that really offers equity and equitable ways of serving people. And according to Healthy People 2030, Health equity involves the highest attainment of health for all people. There are treatment models um, for chronic health conditions and behavioral health to further best practices for black health and wellness. And I'll mention a couple of um, approaches here. So cardiovascular care in black women. Uh, one particular intervention known as RISE has been in place um, and it stands for resilient stress and ethnicity. This uh, RISE intervention entails an eight week group integrating cognitive behavioral and mindfulness strategies. It focuses on the biopsychosocial impact of racism, racial identity and resilience. And with this RISE intervention preliminary, they found um, amongst Black women participants, avoidance coping significantly declined. So uh, the women were able to were able to practice more adaptive coping versus avoidance. Secondly, uh, inflammatory markers decreased for women in the RISE group. So these markers um, are known physiological contributors that um, raises the risk of developing a cardiovascular disease. And those markers decreased after the RISE intervention, which is important to note. So this intervention um, has been applied to look at cardiovascular care. And again, um, it's been ongoing. The next approach I'd like to highlight has to do with prostate cancer and actionable ideas. And we know that according to the research, African-American men have a higher incidence of prostate cancer. It is multifactorial, including social networks, contributing to certain lifestyle and dietary issues, 
But aside from that, um, there are influences in the tumor environment. This cancer report um, identified genomic and molecular differences also as contributing. And um, they concluded that genomic profiling can be applied to integrate clinic, clinical and um, genomic data to improve diagnosis and treatment for African-American men. Essentially, um, elevating what's known as precision oncology designing unique treatment plans and programs for African-American men. Also important to note, um, they recommend risk stratification to support mapping to appropriate clinical trials for African-American men, thereby being able to um, identify early in the process those who may be at risk. These are some recommended books so this first one, Weathering, is from a public health scholar, and it really talks about um, what's known as allostatic load and how that causes wear and tear physiologically, um, raising the risk of marginalized populations developing a chronic health problem. Uh, this middle book is The Inner Work of Racial Justice, healing ourselves and transforming our communities through mindfulness. So this um, important piece of work really calls upon us to practice that mindfulness uh, individually and communally to heal. And in that RISE intervention, um, as you heard, they did incorporate mindfulness. And then this last book, uh, Legacy, was released in January of 2024, so recently. It's written by a black physician and her reckoning with racism in medicine. And so Dr. Uche Blackstock um, talks about her experiences um, as a physician in training and also as a practitioner. Our last cultural conversation spotlight of the day is Dr. David Sadger. He is our 16th US Surgeon General who was also director of the CDC from 1993 to 1998. He is the recipient of numerous awards. And Dr. Satcher uh, founded what's known as the Satcher Health Leadership Institute in 2006. It's at Moore High School of Medicine, and it continues to improve public policy, public health policy, and cultivates diverse leadership. So I encourage you to visit that website to learn more about this phenomenal institute. And here I'll leave you with some references. So this is a list of um, various references of pieces alluded to during this talk. I thank you for your time and your attention during this hour. Here is my contact information, and you may find me on LinkedIn listed as such. Have a wonderful day.